Good evening and thank you so much for joining us at this APM Northwest Branch webinar. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and you are in this any mode. We're just going to go through a few housekeeping points before I hand you over to our speaker, kindly joining us this evening, Michaela. So you are in a listen only mode, but we would like you to participate. Throughout the broadcast, please do write any questions you have in the questions area of your GoToWebinar dashboard. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, where we will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible. There will also be two audience polls taking place this evening and your responses to those will be very valuable to us. So thank you in advance. After the webinar has finished, later this week, you will receive an email providing you with the URL links for the APM webinar resources from this evening. And in that email is a request for your feedback which will help us support future webinar contributions from both this branch and the wider APM. Delegates should self-assess on their CPV certificates. I'm very glad that that's the end of the housekeeping and that we can now hand over to Michaela who will give a short introduction about herself and then also take us into the content for today. And thank you very much for joining this webinar, Reference Class Forecasting. Useful method or random number generator. Thank you ever so much for joining us this evening, Michaela, and I will hand over to you. Thank you so much, Maya, for the introduction. And yeah, thank to all of you who have dialed in to um, or taking your time to dial into this talk on reference class forecasting, useful method or random number generator. And thanks to the Association for Project Management for hosting this. And a special thanks to Mark Waring from the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority for inviting me to do this talk. I will, for um, bandwidth reasons now, switch my camera off. <laughs> but I'm hoping that it'll all be smooth and that I can switch it back on maybe for the um, Q&A session. So on this front page, I've just popped on a little picture of how HS2 may come to look in the future. Um, for those of you not familiar with HS2, it is the high speed two in Britain, which is the new net zero carbon high speed railway. It's also the UK's flagship transport leveling up project, and it is currently the biggest rail investment ever made in the north of England, as well as the, um, the largest infrastructure project in Europe. And it's again been quite a lot in the news recently. So I would just like to pose a question here for us to begin this talk with. Could there have been a more realistic estimate to um, set out uh, with, the, with the onset of the HS2 project? So I'll come back to that later in the talk. So in terms of mega project management or mega projects in a wider context, my passion really lies in understanding how we can use mega projects as a force for good. So as an example in the green energy transitioning where more realistic, more accurate estimates for the mega project performance in terms of delivery are really important in informing our understanding of how and, and by when we can reach the net zero targets that we have boldly set ourselves. And so to that end, RCF or reference class forecasting can really provide important insights to inform our prioritization of projects and hence hopefully also better resource allocation. But so in terms of what we'll cover this evening, um, I'll start by giving you a couple of examples of mega project performance, then talk through what are the main causes of mega project risk, and then what are the cures for mega project risk here, focusing on reference class forecasting, because that's what this talk is primarily about. And then a little bit about how you can apply RCF, what are the typical misconceptions about RCF, which should then hopefully leave us with about 15 minutes for a Q&A session. So in terms of some examples of mega project performance, well, first of all, let me just define what we mean by mega projects, which are also sometimes called major capital projects. 
Um, these are basically projects that are over a billion dollars or a billion pounds. And Oxford Global Project, which is the company that I work with, where I am currently the head of resilience and sustainability, and I have a focus on the green energy transitioning. Um, but within Oxford Global Projects, or OGP, we have a vast experience of working on the risk assessment of complex and uncertain mega projects. So during the front end, when projects are appraised, there's typically three questions that are usually considered, right? You, you think about, is this project economically, feasible, economically viable? As a second um, question, is the project affordable? And a third question is like, what project budget and timeline should be set? And this is really where RCF comes in as a very useful probabilistic forecasting tool to inform discussions on the risk appetite and the affordability. So here's just a couple of examples, a few examples going from the Olympics in Rio, the Edinburgh tram, um, the M plus Hong Kong Museum of Visual Culture, Visual Art, um, and I've also popped the, the NDA on here, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority in the UK, where there are definitely some challenges for all of these projects around estimating the cost and the time schedule for these large projects. So a little bit more detail on a few of those projects. So as an example, the Edinburgh tram. Well, this project was first proposed in June 2000. The tram service was going to be 14 kilometers between York Place and Newtown and Edinburgh Airport with about, uh, well, 15 stops in total. So the, the full business case cost was estimated to be just under 500 million. They came with a contingency of 37 million, the contingency being the budget that's saved in advance of starting the project in case you run into some kind of unexpected cost um, or time delays. Um, so they had a contingency of 37 million, which gives you 535 million. Um, and this was for the phase 1A only with an estimated opening in 2011. So that was the estimate. In reality, the project had an outturn actual cost of nearly 780 million pounds opening in 2014, i.e. 52% over budget and three years late and with a severely reduced scope because they actually never built this bit of it within that scope. Had we applied an RCF estimate back then, we would have given them an estimated nearly 600, um, well, yeah, 697 to 780 million as um, uh, an estimated budget within the kind of certainty aspect that, that they were looking at achieving. As another example, the Hong Kong Express Rail Link, which was the first high-speed railway connecting Hong Kong with Chinese mainland. Um, this was estimated to cost around 40 billion Hong Kong dollars and take about four years to build. The trouble here was that they based it on previous much smaller projects which had been developed and delivered by the same railway developer who was undertaking this project. Um, but so four years into it, with no end in sight and ballooning budget, you can imagine how much trouble they were in. So they asked OGP to come in and do another estimate of this project. And we ended up with an estimate based on similar past performance of similar projects, um, not similar performance, sorry, the performance of similar projects to have an, an estimated cost of 85 billion Hong Kong dollars. Mind you, this was very high confidence, low risk appetite estimate because this was basically the developer's last chance to go to government and ask for more money again. Um, and we estimated that it would be a six year project schedule and the XLR then completed within budget and on time. Solar power is indeed the best performing of the uh, five different industries that were in that poll. So um, basically 
through OGP's research, we've shown that these mega projects are much more likely to experience overruns in time and cost than underruns, and that the potential magnitude of those underruns is likely to be much greater than the magnitude of underruns. But so at this end of the spectrum, so 33% of you voted that, yeah, solar power is the best performing, which indeed it is. They typically experience 1% on average cost overrun. The frequency of cost overruns in terms of how many projects out of 10 is about, it's, well, it is not about, it is four, um, four out of 10. In terms of schedule overrun, that's also very small. Um, benefits overrun is not something that we're currently measuring um, and there are no black swans, black swans being for this sample any projects that have um, a higher cost overrun than 88%. So solar power is at this end of the spectrum whereas Olympics, which was interestingly enough, not the one that you voted for being the worst performing, that was actually rail as far as I remember, that only got 6% of votes. The Olympics for the five that were in that poll is by far the worst performer with an average of 157% overrun, 10 out of 10 overrun. The schedule overrun, well, for obvious reason, that's zero because they kind of have to complete when they have to be complete, right? Um, and interestingly enough, we often see on mega projects where there's a very strict deadline that the developers end up throwing money at them to get them to complete on time. In terms of benefits overrun, again, for this, not something we're typically looking at, but that could be something like, well, how much of these stadiums are used by the general public afterwards? Um, and we see a lot of the like a, a lot of the projects in the sample being black swans, i.e., projects that perform very badly and have um, an overrun of over eighty-eight percent. So let me just change slide here. So. Basically, um, looking at our projects and seeing this repeatedly over the past 10 plus years, one of the directors of OGP, Professor Ben Flubriak, came up with the iron law of mega project, which is basically stating that they are over budget, over time and under benefits over and over again. So as a snapshot, just looking across all industries that we have in our database, here the end values of the number of projects was just over 16,000 projects. So that's your 100% of those less than half come in on budget or better. Less than 10% come in on budget and on time or better. And only half a percent of these projects come in on budget, on time and on benefits or better which basically says that this is the likelihood of success if we keep delivering projects as we have always done. Like there's been no improvement of this for as long as these types of data have been recorded. Um, and so I'm hoping you'll all agree with me if you, for instance, look at the green transitioning with all these mega projects that have to come online for us to reach net zero targets, that is really something that we would hopefully um, all agree on there is definitely room for improvement here. So looking at what are then the main causes of mega project risk? Well, conventional wisdom in mega project management really typically sees causes of risk as mainly external to the project. So overruns are typically explained by um, scope changes, complexity, technology errors, all these external causes. But really the way that um, we see it from a reference class forecasting methodology perspective is that overruns are caused by risk underestimation. So risks tend to be looked at as external, but really all risks are internal in that the, the risks are not um, considered internally and therefore overruns are caused by initial underestimation. 
So then the question is, why do we repeatedly underestimate risk? And there are various explanations for this. And I'll just briefly touch upon um, a couple of them here. The first one here is technical risk. So this I'll not talk any more about because the systematic problems that we see in mega project management can't be explained by estimation error alone. Um, so then we look at various behavioral biases and these are known to be two of the most important ones, i.e. the psychological bias, we're looking at optimism bias and the planning fallacy. And then as a third, like behavioral slash cognitive bias, we're looking at political and economic biases, so i.e. strategic misrepresentation. So just a little bit more on those two latter ones. Basically, optimism bias is the tendency to be overly optimistic about the outcome of a planned action. So this can include overestimating of the frequency and the size of positive events and us underestimating the frequency and size of negative events. And the planning fallacy is very similar in that it's about the tendency to underestimate cost, schedule and risk and overestimate benefit and opportunity. And these are really like very ingrained um, human nature behaviors because it kind of makes us get back up onto the horse if we have this slight rose-tinted view of the world that will make us try again and again and again and do things like get married. So here are a few examples of how optimism bias really influence our decision making in uh, daily, daily decision making. Um, so as an example, not something that happens daily to most of us, hopefully, but almost all newlyweds in a US study expected their marriage to last a lifetime, which is interesting because these are people that are in a place where they can just go onto Google and check out the divorce statistics in their hometown, which would give them um, some very different statistics than a lifetime. Then we have a professional financial analyst who consistently overestimate their corporate earnings. Similarly, we have second year MBA students in Oxford who overestimate the number of jobs offers that they will receive as well as their starting salary upon finishing their studies. And also, if you ask most smokers, they believe that they, for some reason, are at less risk of developing smoking-related diseases than other people who smoke. So that is, in essence, optimism bias. The other behavioral bias that I listed was the economic political bias. And here we're specifically looking at strategic misrepresentation, which is the planned systematic distortion or misstatement of fact, i.e. lying in response to incentives in the budget process. So really, this is, this is like one of the many planners we have talked to over many years, um, saying that we know that this is not the real cost. And cost underestimation is obviously not explicit as such. I mean, people will rarely sit down around a table and decide how are we going to underestimate the cost of this project. It's more like a tacit culture of strategic misrepresentation that exists in many places. And interestingly, from our research, we can see that it varies between companies. It also very much varies between geographies, where in, in some geographies, strategic misrepresentation just has... Um, yeah, it is more renowned than, than in others. It's, it's interesting to see that it's optimism bias for the majority in, in this country, as I said, in, in other cultures where there is um, a bigger focus on the, the political agenda, there isn't so much room for optimism bias, so then it is the strategic um, misrepresentation that, that is more renounced. Um, so... Bearing that in mind, optimism got various biases, various reasons for the, the mega project underestimation of risk. What are the cures for mega project risk? And here we'll just 
focus on on reference class forecasting. Um, so reference class forecasting is in essence a method used to make forecasts based on historical data from a reference class of similar past projects or events. So um, projects that have already been completed that are similar to the one you're currently working on or looking to estimate. So reference class forecasting is a non-simulation probabilistic method, which was actually developed by Professor Ben Flubia for the Bridges Department for Transport, specifically to deal with the optimistic or the optimism bias of estimating the capital project cost within DFT. It's also been cited as the single most important piece of advice regarding how to increase accuracy in forecasting through improved methods. And if you haven't already read it, I strongly recommend um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman as a really interesting read on many levels and walks in life. It's not just interesting from, from an estimating point of view. So what does reference class forecasting actually do? Well, as a probabilistic forecast representing the full distribution of forecasted outcomes, in the statistician's language, RCF will look to regress the best guess from the inside view, so the inside expert view, so here in red, towards the most likely case of the reference class of past similar projects. So that's the one here. So shifting this, what you could call P50, so the most likely scenario from, from the inside view expert forecast, to the most likely outcome within the distribution from the reference class. So that's the one. And the two is that it also looks to expand the estimate of the interval. So here in the red, from the inside view expert forecast, which is um, typically um, a, a QRA to providing the internal bottom-up forecast, um, this then, like the reference class forecasting methodology, then looks to expand the estimate, the narrow estimate here in grey, to the full um, interval of the reference class. Um, and that is super important because, as I said before, cost and schedule overruns in capital projects are not normally distributed. Their, their distributions tend to be positively skewed with much fatter tails on the right hand side, seen here, meaning that they're more prone to overruns than underruns, and overruns are typically larger than underruns. And there's also a bigger variation, i.e. the wider interval in the reference class forecasting methodology, um, be because there is, a, there is a bigger variation in the project outcome than in the internal inside view expert forecast typically, because RCF includes everything that happened in previous completed projects. So also all the things that the experts and involved stakeholders did not consider. So what exactly does that mean? Well, it means in a sentence that RCF takes into account unknown unknowns because it incorporates in the reference class all the effects on performance that previous projects encountered. So the next thing then is how do you apply reference class forecasting to a mega project or indeed a project? I mean, it doesn't have to be a mega project, right? It could be your home renovation. So there are really three steps to reference class forecasting. You build a reference class of similar projects, i.e., so, so here, is an example of just looking at the cost overruns, so estimating the cost. You take actual project cost from previously completed, completed projects and estimated project cost, and then you have a ratio. So the first one is to collect the data for a representative reference class of past completed projects. Then you get that ratio. You can then show the cost overruns experience by plotting the ratios 
um, as a cumulative distribution. So that then gives you like the distribution of the cost of runs experienced by these projects in your reference class, which you can then look at here and say, okay, so 50% of these projects had an overrun of 25%. So provided that your project that you're going to compare to this reference class, provided that your project performs no better and no worse than the projects in the reference class, we can translate that x-axis into the probability and your project is then somewhere on that curve. And you can then go in and select the appropriate level of probability for your risk appetite and then um, apply the corresponding uplift. So if we say that you want to be pretty certain that you come in on budget, so you're going for a P80 here, so you're leaving just 20% chance of overrunning that budget, you want to then apply an 85% uplift to your baseline estimate, like your deterministic baseline estimate with no padding no contingency in there. So that was all a bit abstract. So I like to um, illustrate things with actual examples. So taking us back to high speed two phase one cost estimate, which OGP has been involved in since 2019. So HS2 had an original estimate of 15 and a half billion pounds cost year here is 2013. Um, and that was in the outline business case that was accepted by DFT and Treasury. So this is just showing you how the HS2 team arrived at the contingencies that they calculated into this project. So they had a, um, so they, they did standard QRA, um, quantitative risk analysis, where they had a risk identification workshop, they had expert assessment, various key stakeholders commenting on the risk and likelihood of them occurring. Then they did a Monte Carlo simulation to get that risk distribution that they then um, based their probabilities on. So here we have a P50, so the most likely outcome scenario, where they then got to a 24% uplift, which equates to just under 4 billion pounds to be added to the 15.6, more than 15 and a half billion pounds. Their P95, which is being pretty certain with only leaving like 5% um, chance of overrunning that budget, they got to a 37% uplift, um, which equates to around 6 billion, or just under 6 billion pounds to be added as an uplift as, as the contingency. Now, interestingly enough, that's only 13 um, percentage points difference between a P50 and a P95, which, mm, yeah may have raised some questions already back then. Um, so then OGP coming in to do reference class forecasting for the HS2 team. Step one is building the reference class for HS2. So we did this by selecting past similar projects based on statistical similarity. So we wanted to test if these other projects could be pulled with um, high-speed rail projects. So we had 39 high-speed rail projects. We looked at conventional rail, fixed link, metro, and road, and found that only the fixed link across the distribution are not statistically different from high-speed rail. Um, so then we did a final selection of the reference class to include 39 high-speed rail projects and 132 fixed linked, equaling being then equal to 171 projects in the reference class. And so the reason we want to, to pool and to have more data is because, well, with, with, with statistics, with anything like with probability, the, the, the more data points, the better, right? The more robust the reference class. 
So going forward with those 171 projects as a step one, the step two was then establishing the cost distribution for this reference class of projects. So apologies here, we've swapped the X and the Y axis around because this is um, the more traditional way of looking at this if you want to compare to your QRA. So we now on the Y axis have the cumulative frequency in um, of, of the projects. So we can say here that, okay, 50% of the projects had an overrun of 23%. So that's pretty close to what they internally said would have to be their uplift, right? So we can also see um, from this reference class that um, cost overruns are pretty common in that three out of four projects suffer from overruns. There are also some underruns. Um, and we also have a really high cost overruns, which, which are not unlikely with one in eight projects more than double in cost. Um, so looking then here at the step three, which is comparing the inside view estimate here, the QRA and Monte Carlo estimate or risk distribution with the RCF outside view, because these are, this, is, this is the view from past completed external projects in the reference class. So here in the, the OBC is the outline business case. So this is the HS2 teams estimate, that narrow little blue green thing here. And you can then compare that to the risk distribution from the reference class. Looking at it as a density trace, you can also see, see it here, a bit more visual in that this was the internal pretty narrow QRA, where this was the P50, so the most likely outturn um, case. And then basically comparing the inside view with the reference class forecasting show us that the P50 that they come up with internally, where they wanted to add 24% as contingency, equates to a P51 in the reference class. So very good overlay there, that's in agreement. Looking at the P75 risk in the conventional forecast, so towards the, the outer edge of their distribution, that equates only to a P70 in the reference class. And, ta-da, the long fat tail, um, the P95 in the reference class asks for a 136% uplift um, on the baseline estimate. So what does that actually look like in, in real numbers? Um, so going back to the outline business case inside view, they were saying uh, just under 20. We were saying the same. For their P95 though, they were saying 21 and a half billion, whereas the reference class forecast States nearly 37 billion, and this is still in 2013 money, so that today would equate to around 44 billion in 2023. So, interestingly enough, with the most recent um, scenario or uh, the most recent uh, developments in the HS2 project. They have now abandoned phase two, which then limits the estimated spend to 35 to 45 billion for phase one. So I'm hoping that this will allude to the title of this talk about whether or not reference class forecasting is a useful method or a random number generator in that both when you retrofit something and when you apply reference class forecasting at the beginning of a project and see how the project develops, it is often better than the existing um, internal typical estimation tools which are dominated by, by QRA. So, that said, what are the typical misconceptions about RCF? So these are some of the things that our clients say to us again and again um, across various industries. 
So there is a lot of talk about, well, this is just like contingency upon contingency and it's so inflated. Ideally not, right? So where we have data without contingency, the resulting RCF provides a suggested uplift to be added to your deterministic baseline cost. So ideally, within an organization, you would know how much padding is already added within your estimate, and you need to strip all that out before you add the suggested RCF uplift. Another one we often hear is this is then just history repeating. I mean, we don't really want to apply this uplift to then just perform as badly as previous projects, which is a fair point, but no, fully agree we set out to beat the odds. RCF makes you aware of how projects performed in the past, and then we need to look into understanding why is that, so that you can inform your risk mitigation strategy and increase your chances of outperforming the performance of previous projects that are in your reference class. We also hear this is like comparing apples with rocks. I get that. I'm from a technical background myself, but RCF is not about exact similarity of technology necessarily. It doesn't matter in this um, methodology if it is exactly the same type of nuclear reactor when you're looking at decommissioning, because it is about the similarity of the risk distribution. So. Um, as an example for first-of-a-kind project types, it is often very insightful to see how other first-of-a-kind projects performed. As an example, we're working on hydrogen hub projects at the moment. There aren't much data on how they perform out there. So we can then come up with some relevant proxies of similar types of complexity, similar types of um, schedules, similar types of, um, of budget, and then look at, okay, so in terms of maybe other energy asset proxies, what can we learn from how they performed? Um, another one is, this is way too subjective. So for some client organizations that we work with, they, within different departments, use RCF in different ways. So, of course, that can create some issues and where adjustments are made to where your project sits on the RCF curve, those need to be made as objectively and as consistently as possible across an organization and also across the different stages of the project as it develops. Um, there's obviously a lot to be said on that with regards to how mature is your project and therefore, and where are you in your project? So how many risks can you kind of take off as these are no longer so relevant? So that, that is a, a good long discussion. And last but not least, I mean, there are many more. I just don't want to um, talk for too much longer. So... Um, another one we hear often is, well, our project will never be approved if we present this to investors or other key stakeholders. Inflating the project cost or indeed the schedule time using the suggested RCF uplift can look very scary compared to the QRA. Um, but it's important to also remember that the RCF is not a standalone tool. This is to be used in conjunction with other tools, and it is there to inform the discussion on risk appetite and project affordability. So this is very much a should cost discussion and a could cost discussion. Having said that, I'll be um, blunt enough to, to say here in this forum that more projects, many more projects should go back to the drawing board and come back with a, a more mature strategy for execution, be it a, a more mature technology or a 
um, a, a team of developers who've done this before or whatever that might be to bring that risk down. And so this is really about informing the discussion to prioritize between projects as, as much as anything else. <clears throat> So I want to wrap up here by saying the, the key take home message from this talk on reference class forecasting is to remember that it enhances the accuracy of estimates by leveraging the full distribution of historical data to provide you with a more realistic and objective basis for decision making. And so just a final little blurb from my side before we go into a Q&A discussion. Um, what, what can we do to use mega projects as a force for good? I mean, they are, um, there's going to be an increasing number of mega projects in the energy industry if we are going to reach the net zero targets that we've set. So how can this help informing policy for better incentivization? How can it be used to optimize resource allocation? So this is, again, all results from a more robust or a, a higher quality decision making. Um, how can we look at project appraisals? At the moment, there is an interesting selection effect, right? Because quite often the worst projects are approved because they look best on paper, right? Because they have the highest um, cost benefit ratio because the what we everything I've just talked about, how we underestimate the cost and, and the schedule, how fast can we get there and we overestimate the benefits. So ideally this is all part of refining the system in in mega project management to simply have requirements for more efficient delivery. So this can be down to experience of the people, but also the experience of the technology, maybe incentivizing using more proven technology um, to avoid that internal beginner syndrome as well. And also um, awarding projects that have um, put some thought and, and have an aspect of modularity, right? So as another mega project uh, example, the Empire State, State Building was um, was not a 102 story building. It was actually more built like 102 single story buildings, which allowed the the builders to come up that really important positive learning curve and deliver a beautiful project within time and budget. So with that said um this is the time for q a i hope that my internet was stable and that you could all hear what i said all the way through ideally crystal clear thank you ever so much for that rich and um very well presented content there we have had some audience questions there is still time if you haven't yet submitted them it to do so in your GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, so I'm just going to start sort of going back to the beginning, really. There have been a few questions about your reference that RCF has used for mega projects. So do you have a definition of what that is and also the reasons why it's not normally used for smaller projects? and if it has been successful, if you have any examples of those smaller projects. Definitely, and thanks for that. Yeah, so mega projects are typically defined as any project that is above one billion pounds or one billion dollars. Um, we uh, as a company, so therefore my experience is, is primarily across the build environment, social transport and, and infrastructure. So for example, energy infrastructure projects. Um, and I guess answering why is it primarily applied to mega projects? Well, that's because there is a mega lot risk at stake, right? It's a lot of money. Um, and 
historically the the QRA which kind of dominates internal risk assessment at the moment um, has kind of proven that the, there is definitely room for improvement here right so that's why this methodology was developed it can totally and very successfully be applied to much smaller projects like I hinted to earlier um, home renovations so in Professor Ben Fribia's recent book how big things get done um, there is a, a pretty interesting home renovation project I guess one I don't want to call it limitation because that's such a negative connotation word but I guess you can only really apply reference class forecasting as a solid method where you can find the data right so depending on what your project is you ideally need to be able to go out and find similar data be it um, similar technology or similar risk distribution but you need something to start off with right um, so as an example looking at first of a kind fusion which we're involved in um, there isn't a whole lot to go out and compare to there so it really also depends on the open-mindedness of the client I guess to some extent but so on one of the fusion projects we're working on the client is fully in on yeah this is not about us comparing apples with apples I want you to go out and find what is relevant to compare this first of a kind project to whatever that may be and if you find that the Olympic Games have a similar risk distribution then whack them in to the reference class forecast yeah so we do obviously test the different asset classes so um, as another example you could maybe pull early grid batteries with um, early solar PV projects just testing to see if those distributions are the same but sorry um, going back to the question it, it can really be applied to any sort of size of project as long as you can find some data that you'd like to compare your own project to yes of course it goes back to that data question and we've actually had two questions about the data can you compare by phase using RCF so design construction commissioning as you sort of go through the planning of your mega projects and also Oh, sorry. No, no, you, you answer. Okay. Uh, yes, so sorry, you said by phase, yeah? As in yes, the phase of the project development. Yes, yes that is entirely possible. We have um, pre FID, so I guess um, what I presented here was probably mainly project and um, construction all projects all construction so we can look at the entire project from FID to construction completion we can also look specifically at pre FID so all the planning all the regulatory all that because very often that's where we see the majority of schedule delay yeah which will then have an enormous impact on anything that is to follow um, as, a, as an example if you want to construct an ammonia plant it typically takes five years for everything to be in place before construction begins and then it's much quicker and much less risk to actually build the ammonia plant yes of course at what level of subjectivity does RCF still have is it still at the human judgment what data bank and project should be modeled in relation to your project or is it sort of machine learning and AI to remove those data biases that's an interesting question um, how we are still typically doing it is very human based but we are looking at automating 
processes and for different application we have developed ai based tools internally so that is um that is in development and I would like to add to that as well that the slides I showed here just used a, a subset of the full OGP database, which is now just over 20,000 projects for which we have the data we require to, to do the RCF analysis. That's really helpful. Thank you. How have you or could you see RCF being used for managing stakeholder expectations? about what things might cost yeah that is that is a nice question so managing stakeholder expectations i mean with with quite a lot of clients we have this this is what it should cost like this is our estimate based on the input that we have gathered from the involved entities in this project and this is the could cost, and that's where you bring in the RCF scenario, right? Um, so, in terms of managing expectations, um, let me just see if I can bring up this slide. So, there is an element of who do you say what to, I guess. Um, so, it depends on which stakeholders you're talking to, I would say. So, for instance, if you're talking to contractors with, in terms of pain and gain sharing agreement, you might want to disclose your P30, yeah? And then the most likely estimates so are your P50 that you allocate to the mega project based on the portfolio management approach and then your P80 is like you're quite conservative so typically most of our clients again depending on industry or private industry it really depends on the, on the company again very much also on the affordability right because the more certain the estimate obviously the, high, the higher the cost because the higher the contingency but so a P80 which we see as quite a conservative estimate is then allocated to the portfolio level and really only held by the by the owners of the of the program. Does that does that sort of answer the question? Yes, certainly. That's really helpful. And looking at this uplifts, we had a few questions about this. Is that the baseline cost estimate, the eighty five percent uplift? The, so the 85% uplift would have to be added to your baseline cost estimate. Yeah, okay. so that's then, for the, that was for the HS2. And no, how sorry. do you then model and estimate the contingency on top of that uplift has come in? Sorry, how do you model? Well, the, how do you model and estimate the contingency on top of that uplift? Ah, yeah, you don't. This is ah. everything. So, so this is where we have the eighty-five percent. Yeah. So, if you you have your project, the deterministic baseline cost of your project. So this is basically what it will cost to get all the parts all the enabling works, whatever it is you're building, all the construction people, that all that's cost added up. That's your baseline deterministic estimate for the full project cost or the construction cost or whatever you're looking at. Then you say, okay, I want to go for a PAT because I want it to be quite conservative. I want to be quite sure that I'm going to come in on budget and I can afford it. So then you look to add 85% to that baseline cost. So that, I mean, the contingency conversation is an important one to have. So for this particular reference class where we're looking at this distribution, for this to be true, these, this data, this data needs to be without the contingency, right? 
So if for some reason we have projects where we cannot strip out the contingency, we will give our clients a curve like this and say, okay, this includes contingency. So you need to compare this to your baseline estimate, including your cost risk. Yeah, so there it's important to compare apples with apples and pears with mm -hmm. pears. So it's either without contingency or it's with contingency. That's, that's very clear and very understandable why that needs to have that match, like you say. We are now coming up to our full hour, astonishingly. It's been so engaging. Thank you very much indeed. I just wanted to ask one final question which is what are the key takeaways we need to understand and employ in our work? Well, I think the key takeaways are to not be too siloed and to look outside. Well, so as a, like, I, I have a scientific background, right? So I would always say, okay, I'm doing this experiment slash technical um, pilot, but I'm keen to learn from other people's mistakes or from other, other projects' mistakes. So it's really the key take home is really looking at implementing methods where you leverage that full distribution of historical data. So not just having that more silo, siloed or, or internal view of the world and just looking at, oh, our past experiments have all performed like this, but maybe looking a little bit more broader than that. What an excellent way to finish. Thank you so much for all that you've managed to fit into this hour, for the breadth and also the clarity. It has been very well received. Thank you for the audience for attending and for participating in the audience polls and your very long list of questions, which have been really helpful just to further and reinforce some of those points that were made during the presentation. I wish you all a very good evening. <laughs>